Hello and welcome to the show. This is the success show for Beepo and right now I'm speaking to you from Hagley Park in Christchurch. We're here for the RISE conference. I'll tell you more about that in another show. When we were in New York attending the Inman Connect conference, Amy Endelman and I caught up with a number of people from Australia, from all around the world in fact, who attended the conference, one of the biggest conferences in the world. Today in the show, Amy and I are going to present a highlight some of the interviews that we conducted while we were there. I know you'll enjoy the show. And a very special segment in the business show, joining me, Amy Engelman from uh, Beepo, Beepo Outsourcing. And we're in New York, Amy. Isn't this exciting? It is exciting and cold. And cold. It is very cold. Uh, we recently uh, were um, doing a lot of filming and meeting people at the Inman Connect show in New York. And we happen to find Janusz Hooker, LJ. I think everyone calls you LJ. Sometimes. Janusz is good too. Janusz is good too. Yeah. Uh, Janusz, uh, thank you for joining us in the show. Great to talk to you. Of course, an iconic brand, LJ Hooker, been around for so long. So long so that you even have written a book about the history. Tell me, what's the story behind that? So my sister wrote the book, Natalia Hooker. And um, it's a book that every page has got a, uh, a piece of Australian history in it where LJ Hooker either contributed to the greater society or helped develop uh, property or property technology. And that's a good segue in why I'm here because, uh, you know, Inman Connect is sort of the, the centerpiece of prop tech leading forward. I'll just get a shot of the, the book on the front here. 90 years. That's right. You don't look a day over 30. <laughs> yeah. uh, a few days in New York and you feel. I actually lived here for seven years, so it's sort of. My, one of my second homes in the world. In New York? You in New York? Yep. Yeah. All through the noughties. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. fun. Tell, tell me about the brand. It's had a wonderful time in the, in the 90 years. How did it all start? Um, well, it started with my grandfather back in 1928. Um, he, was a, he was an orphan and um, he decided that he wanted to get into the biggest game in town, which was real estate. And so one brokerage became several hundred. And he also went on to build one in five homes in Australia through the uh, 20th century and introduced property trust into the country, managing 36 big box retail malls, introduced franchising into the country. An amazing story for from rags to riches. And so he's a big, been a big inspiration in my life. And um, one of his keys to success was traveling around the world, even way back then. So it would take you three days to get from Sydney to New York or London. And he would do that every second year for two months of the year. And he would collect best practices and introduce them into Australia. And that's why the company did so many amazing things to develop the society. That's an incredible growth story mm -hmm. and incredible Australian success story, really. Yeah. And so, you know, you've touched on technology and best practice and, and obviously that's why you're here at Inman. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the insights or trends that you're seeing that, that are um, of interest to you? Yeah, look, it's always fascinating to come to global conferences like Inman. And um, you know what I've learned over the last couple of days is basically you know technology pushing into real estate is really here now. The prop tech revolution is here. There is no doubt about it. And you can see there's no less than uh, 52 software CRM companies now in the states. You know, all vying for a position to do something. Um, you've got amazing companies you know in the brokerage space leading the charge. And um, you know all the panel discussions or everything is like how do we deal with change? because change is here. There was a lot of talk about it, probably in the last five years, but the mood is very different now. It's like change is happening, and all of the players, from big to small, are trying to figure out how to adapt to the, the new world. Like your, was it your grandfather you said started the business? That's right. Your grandfather, like your grandfather, he would take ideas back to Australia. What are you going to take back? Um, there's so many that I've gathered over the last few days, I'd have to sort of distill down. Yeah, I but I think, think... I think that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there are so many now, you really have to focus on the key ones you want to implement and then implement them well. Mm. And look, I think, you know, we recently launched a new concept in Australia called LJ Hooker Avenue, which is our concept store and a very much technology-enabled platform. Um, that's sort of our R&D lab for our greater franchise network. And, uh, you know, there's many ideas that we'll be de deploying into that that concept store, trying them out, and then launching them in the Australian market. But we don't like to talk about anything we do until we've actually got a live product, because um, you know it gets written about, and then nothing happens, and then people say, what happened? So we're all about delivering now best practice globally, making our agents more efficient, 
and most importantly, getting the customer satisfaction levels up. Janusz, one last question, if I may, and that is about international. Um, what, what are your plans international? I know you've already got an international footprint. Um, how will that develop or grow? Well, we're already in um, you know, New Zealand, Indonesia, and China. And so you know, the plan is, is you know, we've consolidated our position in Australia and New Zealand in particular. And in the future, you know, we are an international company, so you know, all the doors are open. Fantastic. Excellent. Janusz, thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations. I appreciate you giving us some time to be in the show. No worries. My thank pleasure. Good, good to see you again. Janusz thank Hooker, you. and we're broadcasting from Inman Connect in New York. Back in a moment. Did you know you can save up to 70% on your staff costs by outsourcing the low value repeatable tasks so your team can focus on growing your business? Bepo is an outsourcing provider focused on the real estate industry. With an English-speaking, tertiary-qualified and fully trained team in the Philippines, Bepo will give your business the boost it needs to start growing and returning value to you. For more information, visit bepo.com.au. And from the Inman Connect conference in New York, uh, we've got the pleasure now, Amy and I, of talking to a broker who helps other brokers uh, market luxury property. Uh, Michael Lafredo. Lafido. Lafido. Yes, My sir. apologies, Michael. No problem. Uh, Michael has also written a book on exactly that topic. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot for joining us. I'd uh, love to just start shooting some questions that's in your area of expertise sure. around luxury marketing and luxury homes. What do you find is the biggest kind of barrier or downfall when agents are listing and marketing a luxury property? Yeah, many, many times it's out of their element. So it's it, it might be their first uh, opportunity to market a luxury home, right? So they do the same things as the properties that have higher turnover rate, which are more entry level or average price properties. So when you're marketing a luxury property, particularly you know $2 million plus in many of the parts of the world, uh, first impressions are really important. So uh, many times agents can get away with things in the, in the properties that are moving quickly, more in seller's markets, but in most marketplaces, that over luxury is what we call a buyer's market. So, you know, first impressions are really important. So no, no cutting corners and, and uh, first impressions with photos, descriptions. I like to refer to it as like a property launch, okay? So when you go to market, it's a property launch. So everything, you gotta have all your ducks in a row from descriptions, photos, the history of the home, videos, marketing materials, both digital and print. And so many agents, they skimp on marketing. Uh, they don't have the marketing budget for the high-end and luxury properties. Just on that point, Michael, I think it would be um, a comment to make about brokers who sometimes feel daunted by marketing an upmarket property. Uh, say a broker who may be used to marketing properties in, in a median price range, all of a sudden they're given the opportunity to market a property in multi-millions. Mm -hmm. They could feel daunted, they could feel out, out, of, out of depth, so they'll probably go to some of those strategies you talked about, try and cut corners. Yeah, I mean, uh, the sales cycle is much longer for these high-end and unique properties. So many times they're used to selling properties, you know, th you know, 30 days or less or 60 days. And, and in some marketplaces, it could be a year or two plus years of inventory. So uh, you have to be smart about your target marketing. You want to get all your ducks in a row, as I mentioned. But, uh, you know, video, event-based marketing, press, PR, uh, when you're dealing with uh, the Uber high-end properties, uh, print marketing is... Uh, it's, it's more um, common and it's uh, the sellers many times expect it versus you know more entry level. Building relationships with sellers too I think is a key thing isn't it? I mean is it does it matter does it matter how uh, big or small your uh, list of potential clients is? It's, uh, it's about networking? Yeah about building the network uh, breaking into and selling high-end and luxury properties is, is you know what we teach we help agents you know get into those circles so uh, just like a movie that Robert De Niro was in called Meet the Parents, it's very difficult to penetrate the circle of trust yes. for high net worth individuals. So uh, we teach strategies to do that. And the biggest thing is be authentic, be yourself, um, do what you say you're going to do. And uh, breaking in with the inner circle many times is how you get to those high net worth individuals is, is you build trust with them, you do what you say you're going to do and uh, word of mouth uh, marketing is, is much more common and, uh, and more valuable than uh, 
print marketing or digital marketing to the masses. So uh, I use the, 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 the term warm marketing versus cord, cold marketing. Warm marketing is people that know you, like you, trust you, uh, referrals. Cold marketing is more prospecting, right, lead generation. Uh, when you're dealing with high net worth individuals, the cold marketing or, or lead generation is not as effective, so it's more referral marketing and, and breaking in with you know, those connections and those referring sources. Sounds like a uh, longer sales cycle, you know, building trust and then you know, from there getting further and further out in terms of referrals and more listings. Is that challenging you know, for the average agent who might have a longer cycle time and then go through periods of you know, no sales while they're waiting for that sales cycle to Yeah, to it, it, it is. So we talk about, just like financial advisors talk about diversification of your portfolio, um, we talk about, uh, to re real estate agents, there's four major price points in most markets, and that's average price homes, um, and a little bit below that is entry level. So you got entry level, you got average, you got high end, and you have luxury. And so I tell agents, look back at the last year, how many homes you sold, and probably 80% of those sales will fall into one of those four buckets. And we encourage agents to, to step out of their comfort zone and, and go after more of those high end and luxury. But if the entry level and average is what's paying the bills and what's selling, don't, don't stop doing that, but just venture into some of those higher end. But uh, limiting beliefs, uh, overcoming objections. What if they ask me how many have I sold? Or I have to be with a certain company, or I have to drive a certain car, or live in a certain neighborhood. These are all limiting beliefs or excuses that agents keep telling themselves. So that's why they won't even uh, you know, take that venture. Just yesterday I was talking to a gal from Atlanta and she had an opportunity to uh, market a $10 million listing and she didn't want anything to do with it. And this is a professional athlete's house. Um, that would have opened so many doors for her. Um, if you think of uh, one of the greatest athletes of all time, Michael Jordan, an NBA basketball player, his home has been on the market for nearly seven years. There's, a, there's an agent that was associated with that home that is no longer associated with it. And he still gets uh, press inquiries and, and I'm reading about it and, and so he's still associated with it. So I believe the fastest way for an agent or a brokerage to get instant credibility from their database, people that know them, like them, or don't know them, like them, or trust them, is you get those, those trophy clients, those trophy listings. One very quick question, if I may, and we're almost out of time, but Michael, why didn't it sell? Why, why hasn't that home sold? Um, well, it, it's currently listed, um, so I have to kind of be careful uh, because I'm a licensed it, agent in that state. But, well, but generally, I find the reason they won't sell is because of price. You know, you price is always an equation, right? Yeah. Um, but the way you're positioning a home, what you're accentuating, it's really our job as an agent to, to accentuate the best features of a home and a location and then downplay the least favorable. So I very rarely will show like a third or a fourth or fifth bedroom in our marketing. I'm really trying to accentuate the lifestyle, right? Does it have a pool? Does it have you know, acreage? Does it have a tennis court? Um, the amenities? And uh, so I think if they did a little bit more of that, it, it, uh, it would definitely help them. Michael, great. Thank you very much for your I time. I appreciate much your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, we're broadcasting from Inman Connect in New York. Back with more in just a moment. Did you know you can save up to 70% on your staff costs by outsourcing the low value repeatable tasks so your team can focus on growing your business? Bepo is an outsourcing provider focused on the real estate industry. With an English speaking, tertiary qualified and fully trained team in the Philippines, Bepo will give your business the boost it needs to start growing and returning value to you. For more information, visit bpo.com.au. Technology is a big player now in the real estate sphere and it was on great display at the Inman Connect conference in New York recently and uh, Amy Engelman from Bepo Outsourcing and I were there. Uh, Amy, you just simply walk around, don't you? Technology everywhere. But the thing that struck me was um, uh, AR, artificial intelligence, um, bots and what they're, ha what they're doing. So we decided it'd be good if we spoke to the lady herself, the queen or, no, the mother, the Rita's mother. Um, you must be sick and tired of hearing that. But Sarah Bell, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin, Amy. 
It's been a great, uh, exciting couple of days, hasn't it? Lots to see, lots of technology, lots of innovation. It's been really fun and thank you for joining us. I wanted to explore a little bit for our um, audience, you know, what is AI? Because we hear it all the time and what are some practical examples that you can give us to just help us in context? Yeah, so the definition of AI is really where a machine is capable of acting and reacting in ways that seem like human intelligence. And the seeming part is probably the important part because it, it isn't exactly like human intelligence. Computers can't handle things they haven't seen before, they can't imagine, they can't create, but what they can do is analyse and predict um, the next best right thing to do. AI is one of those terms where it's kind of been bundled with a bunch of other technology and I think um, you know automation is another really important thing to talk about when we're talking about the new technology. So automation at its probably most sexiest example is when we talk about automated vehicles and really though a lot of technology is now relying on automation and automation can be really simply understood as not requiring a human user. So it's where a, compu a computer can perceive something that's happening in its environment like an event and then that triggers the computer to do something of its own motion without requiring a human to click on a button or cause something to happen. When you couple automation with AI, so computers that can act alone and computers that can think like humans, then you start to get some really exciting capabilities from machines that can help real estate agents. Wow. How are you finding uh, agents or brokers um, generally adapting to AI and, and using tools like Rita? Are, are they starting to embrace it or are they sort of staying back a bit waiting to, well I'll wait and see what happens? Yeah I think there's, um, you know, there's probably an adoption curve with AI like, like all new technology and, uh, and the early adopters have had the gift of time. You know, they get in there and they get their kind of roll their sleeves up and they get to experiment and they get to do everything first. And for those, that select group of innovators, the world's an exciting place right now um, because they're, ha they're helping to shape how this is all, all going to work. Um, at the 11th hour and everybody's trying to, to rush and catch up, those early adopters are, you know, they're the ones that people are chasing. They're onto they're onto the next thing. So, um, so I think with with AI, there's you know there's always going to be those people that are interested and kind of get get innovation and changes instinctively. With AI, though, because we've had so much science fiction around robots and and what's happening, we do kind of see some extreme polarization in in how people feel about it. And that um, you know you get you get people that that love it those early adopters and then you get people that think that robots are going to destroy the world or replace their jobs. And do um, people still think like that? You know, I mean, automation did replace a lot of people's jobs in you know when it came in terms of factories and machines. There was a lot of people lost work in induct in industrial manufacturing. In fact, I was in the elevator with a bunch of people before and, and we were talking about, you know, lift operators who were actually the first victims of automation because they didn't need to wind the lift up anymore. So, so there is kind of like that fear comes from somewhere. It is a rational fear. And, you know, when you think about the thinking kind of comes from this place that a robot will do it all and there will be nothing left from it for a human to do. But I think that robots and humans will work together. I think when you start talking about knowledge work and human services that people are prepared to pay for, there's a lot to that that can't be outsourced to a bot. So what we sort of see is instead of the robot doing it or a human doing it, we start to connect a human to an intelligent computer so that the human is supercharged to act efficiently and do the next best right thing in any given scenario and they become super powered. They're not having to do mundane things over and over again that automation can kind of take care of. And so what you sort of see is that I don't think robots are going to replace real estate agents. I think they will replace many aspects of the work that a real estate agent has to do. But what real estate agents will end up with is a much more interesting, much more human job. I'm just curious, uh, Sarah, as to why we call them robots, because they're anything but. I mean, robots to me are machines that work. 
Whereas here we're talking about an intelligent being, even though it might not be a human being, mm. uh, it's someone who we can relate to, there's no physical presence. So the, I, I don't believe they should be called robots. And, and do you know what, you're probably right, you, you're technically right, because um, because a robot is is strictly, what well, roboticists are strictly people that work in robots that have an Android for And form. they don't learn. Yeah, so, so we're, oh no, the software that powers physical okay. robots yes. um, certainly is capable of learning. So, so the hardware aspect of it, um, in terms of you know the robots that share physical space with us as humans, um, that's kind of strictly what we call a robot. But the software that drives it is still kind of properly termed a robot um, because the, it uses a process called robot process automation. So when when a trigger happens and then something happens in response to it, we still kind of call that a robot because of the the RPA that it uses. The terminology is, um, it's you know, it's it's distressing and it's confusing, and I think a lot of people, you know, maybe use it in the same way that people use high financial jargon to, <laughs> to kind of, you know, create credibility or whatever. But I think fundamentally we can understand, um, you know, physical robots as a replacement or a supplement to human muscle, and we can think of software robots as a complement or a supplement to human intelligence the easiest way I think about it. And here at, here at Inman, Sarah, you know, we've seen a lot of um, examples of AI in the real estate space. And as a consumer, I've started to see the trend now where there's, you know, a lot of chat happening uh, online and, you know, sometimes I think it's a chatbot. When I'm chatting with someone, I know it's probably not a person. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between, you know, Rita and, and her intelligence and what she does for an agent versus what are uh, like a standard chatbot yeah, sort of, sure. um, technology? Look, chatbots are kind of, you know, dominating the, the AI space and, and that's in every industry. and. Really what a chatbot is, is, is an interface for the robot to talk to the human um, and it's just a chat interface. I think as we move you know, more into the future, what we're seeing is the rise in voice interface. So where there's, there's no screen at all and, and you can, you know, hey Siri, hey Google, hey Alexa, um, and they retrieve that information. So the interface when you have a, you know, a human using a robot to retrieve information is important. And, and that can be from, you know, when we type into Google search, if you want to use Google, the Google search and planning AI as a different, you know, as an example of AI. So that's, that's us using a search interface um, or a web interface. And, you know, how we communicate with, ro with robots is, is how they sort of appear and feel to us. Um, they are all reactive, so when you have a human using using any interface, chat, voice, or search, um, or web, it's it's where the human's kind of suggesting to the robot what it needs, and that's super helpful. You know, if you've got questions or you want information, it's just like you know sending a golden retriever to go and fetch something for you, rather than having to go and find and organise it for yourself. Um, Rita, however, she's been engineered to to feel a little bit different and. AI is one of these really cool technologies that yes, it's a tool that you can use to retrieve information, but it's also got the capability to, to take on other roles in your life. It can be a, a colleague or a friend, a peer, it can even be a trainer or a manager. And certainly in the way that Rita works, she manifests in a way that she does feel like a colleague and sometimes like a manager and sometimes like a coach. Um, so, so with Rita, we tend not to wait for the agent to decide what they're going to do. A lot of our research and the development of Rita showed that agents were just had a cognitive overload. There was so much demand on their time and, and so much information and in all these fractured sources that one of the problems we were seeking to solve for agents is what's the next best right thing for me to do? Who do I call and what do I say? So Rita isn't reactive in the same way that search or go fetch kind of functionality is. Rita is proactive in this. She suggests things that might be a good idea for a human to do and her predictive capabilities in identifying opportunities from the data set and then suggesting them to the agents as opportunities to pursue allows the agent to interpret the suggestion, make a judgment and act rather than having to drive and do the mental labour about what they want. The idea is sort of imagine the ultimate secretary that's going to come and organise your day for you and um, 
Actually, funny story, I was just I was just reflecting on one of my first jobs was clerking for a lawyer named Frank. And Frank didn't even had a didn't have a computer. And so my job was to get to the office much earlier than Frank did um, on the days that I was working and go through everything from the day before and have ready on Frank's desk when he arrived um, the, you know, his docket and trial work, which was most important, his correspondence, you know, his, um, his, his business work and, and then any other community work that he was doing and have that all prioritised. And then Frank would then give me other work during the day on a dictaphone. So Frank didn't have to worry about typing and printing. Frank would just say, Sarah, I need, to call, need you to call those blogs that blah, 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 and do blah, blah, blah. And so I would then type the letter and Frank would just sign it. And so kind of this, you know, ultimate secretary that organises your day for you is the experience that we wanted agents to have, but in a low cost way that was scalable. It didn't matter how much work was on, it didn't, you don't need two readers if Rita gets busy. Um, she can just service that demand for you. Mm, what a great description too. We're going to have to leave it there, Sarah, but thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations too. Uh, Sarah was uh, a, sp a speaker on stage and, and did a fantastic job too. Thank you. Sarah, thanks for being with us in the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, thanks Amy. Sarah. And stay with us. Lots more to come. We'll be back in just a moment. Did you know you can save up to 70% on your staff costs by outsourcing below value repeatable tasks so your team can focus on growing your business? BPO is an outsourcing provider focused on the real estate industry. With an English speaking, tertiary qualified and fully trained team in the Philippines, BPO will give your business the boost it needs to start growing and returning value to you. For more information, visit bpo.com.au. And a really hot topic at the Inman Conference in New York, the Inman Connect Conference, is who's better at selling real estate? Is it men or is it women? Now there's a topic for you, Amy. What do you reckon? Controversial. Let's Very controversial. It. Well, we've got a panel here because we're joined by none other than Sherry Storer, who's also been one of our hosts at the Inman Connect Conference. The interviewer Sherry, becomes the interviewee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I'm going to put that question on the table to start with and then we can get into the real serious stuff. Really, who is better at real estate? Is it men or women? Give me the stats because I know what they are. I think it's the ultimate agent. So, you know, the ultimate agent, in my opinion, is one who can play both fields, right? So I don't know that I have a definitive answer for that because I think it comes down to the skill set. Yeah, I disagree because I think there is a definitive answer. There are more women in real estate than there are men. Women are better communicators than men. I just think that men more go for the bottom line. I think there is a change. I think it's coming around and I do believe that women are be going to become more dominant um, you know, for a number of reasons and I just think that they connect better than men do. Well Sherry Chris was saying that in the state 63% of all agents are actually females which is obviously not a trend that we see in Australia but I think when we actually sit it down and really look at, at what women are doing in real estate they have very very different skill sets to what men have and I think women are cultivated quite differently from birth so we're kind of trained to listen and to sit back and to think and to be empathetic and sympathetic whereas men are kind of um, trained in a completely different way to hunt as opposed to gather. So, you know, men are really um, becoming quite more switched on to the fact that they need to become more like women and empathise and be a part of the journey and create more heart-to-heart -heart connections yeah. because that needs to be a learned skill for them. So those men that are actually doing this and learning these skills, they're the ones that are actually really taking flight and doing great things in the industry. Just like conversely, what we're seeing with women is that they really need to step up and start believing in themselves a lot yes. more and, and speaking for themselves and really start practicing that art of self-love and, and saying no to different things and saying yes to a lot more things. So they're the big differences that I see in working with agents. Well, you're doing some great work with empowering women in real estate too, and congratulations on that. Happy to support you in that as well. <laughs> but I do think that it's highlighting the difference, the trend between the transaction and the relationship. You know how we've moved from transactional agents to relationship agents? Yes. And that's why I think women are going to become more dominant because they are better at building relationships. Yeah. Well, buying a property or selling a property is very much an emotional journey. Yes. And for a long time, we've, we've been treating people like they're transactions. People don't like that, they don't want that. That's actually not what, what buying and selling is actually all about. So they're, they're trying to change. But look, you're right, Kevin, supporting women in the industry is, <laughs> is super important to me. And yeah. it's part of the reason 
reason why I created that Women in Real Estate Breakfast series because I wanted to give more voices to different members of our real estate you know, industry and part of that is women. So we want to see more support for you know, support staff and admin staff and property managers and high level management in addition to the agents. And how can we do that? By supporting women on stage and also having men and women in the room together. It's um, interesting at Inman, one of the first sessions were two leading agents, one from New York and the other from Houston that spoke about their experiences and were there to show the best of. And two common themes ran through that. One was care, you know, genuine care for the client, and the other was non-judgmental. So going into any transaction and treating that client like they had $2 million, not 300000 <laughs> And I thought that was really interesting because you know, I, I agree with you, Sherry, that there's some attributes that are just um, inherent for women that have that greater connection to care. But just coming back to success and personal success, I'd love to hear from you a little bit around, you know, what are the sorts of attributes or things that we do outside of work that helps us perform and be successful? Well, I think, you know, in, in real estate, but I think in all aspects of business, actually, the only way that you can truly be successful is if you segment. And the way to do that is to make sure that you're living a really full, balanced life on the outside of your career and you know that's that's what I spend so much of my time coaching on is actually helping agents work out okay well what do I need to do on my outside world in order to be at my peak mental like fitness in order to put together these deals and write more transactions and sometimes that actually means taking time completely outside of work so you know if you're working all the time 24 7 sometimes you can't put deals together because all you're doing is thinking about real estate you can't see the forest with the trees so to speak so I think that's really really important to take time out and to do things that that soothe your soul. So it could be going for a walk, going for a run, doing yoga, doing some sort of formal exercise to actually get your body moving and your juices flowing. I also think, you know, waking up in the morning and doing something that makes you happy. So finding like the joy in your life. And, you know, it could be I've got an agent who loves, you know, jet skiing. So jumping on the jet ski every single day before coming into work and finding something that makes you tick and, and makes you feel really good. So that, that when, when you are at work, you're feeling rejuvenated and you're showing who you are. You're not just doing treating somebody like a transaction because you're tired and you're bored. You're actually excited to be there and people want to do business with other people they like and with that same sort of energy. Love it. And that is so true across all industries, you know, not just real estate. We see burnout so often for high powered yeah. you know, corporate executives, working mums, working parents. You know, that's that's great advice for anyone who's looking to take it to that next level. <laughs> Absolutely. Sherry, you are a superstar. We've loved having you on the show. Thank you for joining us on the business show. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Kevin. Oh, Thank it's you, a pleasure, Amy. darling. All right, all the best. Thank you. <laughs> Sherry Stora has been our guest on the business show. Stay with us, there are lots more to come. Did you know you can save up to 70% on your staff costs by outsourcing the low value repeatable tasks so your team can focus on growing your business? BPO is an outsourcing provider focused on the real estate industry. With an English speaking, tertiary qualified and fully trained team in the Philippines, BPO will give your business the boost it needs to start growing and returning value to you. For more information, visit bpo.com.au. One of the joys of being at a conference like Inman Connect in New York is that you get to meet a huge variety of brokers and real estate agents. And Javier Nichols is joining us from Century 21 Veterans as our next guest. I know you've had an interesting chat. Yes, we have, and thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. I'd like to just dive right in. You're a relatively new agent, been going about 18 months. Tell us about a couple, maybe the top three things that you think have helped make you so successful in such a short amount of time. Well, the three things that made me, that really helped me become successful in my short time were hunger. Hunger as in physical hunger? <laughs> that hunger too. Success? <laughs> yes, well, well, hunger of, of trying to really get out there yeah. and, and to really get my name started, to really, really get, get my face in front of people so everyone can really understand what, what, what I do and how I could do it better, right? What kind of value I can bring, all right? And another thing was passion. Just passionate about my brand, passionate about the company, just passionate about my story and just, just serving people. I love to help. You know, trying to make the process easier for anything is, is, is the root of my passion. You know, trying to make everything very transparent, 
so the regular consumer can really not feel intimidated by the whole purchase process of a home, of a car, of anything. Previously, before this, I was a car salesman. And I know a lot of people think car salesmen typically don't have a good reputation. But for me, I turned that upside down. And I still deal with a lot of my clients who I've dealt with in that industry, in this industry. Actually, one of my first homes was from a client who I sold a car to three years prior. Wow. And we were talking earlier about some of your marketing methods, you know, <laughs> old and new. Yes. So yes. tell me a little bit about how you combine old school and new school and how that all works to produce results. Well, it's no secret. When, when you want to really make a difference, you just go back to what people have done previously. That's why book reading is amazing because it's already been done before. And door knocking, cold calling, these things are feared because they think that they're bothering someone or you're wasting someone's time and you get to call 100 people and 99 of them say no, but that one person. And what I do is I bring value. When I speak to clients on the phone, it's not so much, hey, can I sell buy you? Can I sell you a home or can I help you buy a home? No, it's mainly telling you about what's going on in your neighborhood. What's going on on your street? What have homes sold for around the corner? And then we go into how can I help you? So it's awesome. Video, is that part of your strategy? To yes. use video, tell me how you use it. Well, for video, as you can tell, I love being on video, I love talking to people. I do a lot of workshops um, in my local area where I give people free information about grant programs that may be out, low interest rate programs that could be out, and I do it on video a lot of times. And then it helps me, it helps me become a normal individual for those who don't know me or can't see me. Like, like in person, you know, so I, and I pay for advertisement and put that out there so more people can see it. I have a group called the New Agent Talk within our Century 21 company. We have a workplace platform and I use a lot of video to walk people through certain objections, certain things that are going on that I'm dealing with that they may be dealing with as well. Wow, that's fantastic. And we also spoke about social media and uh, you know, I'm a, a massive fan of social media in our business because I think it opens up a real human element um, and we found it very successful. But tell me how as an agent, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to be very careful about how you present yourself on social media. Well, you do, but then you don't. Um, I say you do because you can't really talk about the things politics, religion, certain things that are sensitive subjects. But what I can talk about is, just like I mentioned before, what's going on? What's the temperature in the market? Like, how can you take advantage of the seller assist? How can you take advantage of the first front door $5,000 grant? And these things people want to know. So I make the video and I show them and I also show them my life. I want them to know I have three kids, I have a wife, just bought a house three years ago. These things I want people to know because I want them to know that I'm doing, the, I, I, I have done the same thing that they're going to do and I can walk you through my experiences. Where you market, where you market yourself and where you work, do you live in that area and do you think that's important? It is and it isn't. Um, I do market in my area particularly, but I also market in other areas, high-end areas and low-end areas. And it's important because I want people to feel like you don't have to live in an area to sell in an area. I, I do deals all over the Philadelphia area, but I live in the suburbs. You don't have to live in an area to sell, but you want to have knowledge. I'm a big person that loves data. I stay up until about 1 a.m. every night, and I go on the MLS and I look up data, I look up trends, I look up market data, and I try to understand what's going on and why is it happening. Your area, the area that you focus on, your core area, maybe around where you live, mm -hmm. how big is that? How many homes are in that area? Well, I call them farms. farms and one of my farms has about 492 homes. I have another farm that has about 572 homes. But in the entirety of the entire area that I cover, maybe over 2,000 homes. But I target those two particular areas and I door knock those two particular areas more than I do others. I think that's an important point, if you don't mind me asking, Amy. How, how, how much time do you spend in those two areas? How do you farm them and how often are you talking to those folks? Well, I take them all in spurts. So, one of my farms, I spend about two weeks doing now. A couple days, two days a week, depending on how long I have and how much time I have. Sure. Um, and then when I'm door knocking, it's not so much, again, it's not so much me talking about real estate. Just letting you know what's going on. You may have a neighbor that just sold for 10 grand above and you want to know that. Or you may have a 
a, a large plot, you know, a large plot, and I can help you sell the back end of your home to an investor who can build. And you never knew it can be possible. So that's what I like to bring, and that's what I love to do. When people see me walking, it's a lot of door knockers out there. You have people that does it for religious purposes, people that do it for monetary purposes, of magazines or whatever it may be. So I have to add that extra value, add the extra system. So door knocking is your primary method of farming? And, well, yes, yeah, so door knocking and phone calling, but I do a lot of open houses that are not my listings. So it's amazing, amazing thing to do. As a newer agent, doing open houses that are not yours, you feel as though that you, you, you can't do it because it's not your listing, but you can within your brand. And that's why I love Century 21 because we have that family structure where as a newer agent, I can say, hey, you sit at home. I'm gonna do the open house here. If anybody comes in and buys, I'll bring you the buyer and I'll help you sell your property. I do a video of that property, do a nice tour, put it out there on the, on the market so you can see it. It's not mine, but I want to know, I want you to know that it's available. So everyone that comes through that door, they meet me, I represent the brand, and I want to give you a good experience. So when you do those open homes, are you, are you looking for buyers for those homes, or are you yes. looking for future sellers? I'm looking for buyers and sellers. Um, when anyone comes from the neighborhood, I always tell them about the property and let them know what has sold. But for buyers that may not have real estate agents, those are the ones I'm after. If you don't have an agent right now, let me become your agent. Here's what I can do. Brilliant. And just before we wrap up, we spoke earlier about the roles that are the most distrusted in the world. Yeah. And you've been a car salesman, which is number one yeah. most least trusted. Yes. And second most least trusted is the real estate agent. Um, so tell me, how do you build relationships and rapport to ensure that your clients trust you and therefore you can move forward with a, with a relationship? That part is easy. Show them the process. Show them what's behind the curtain. Show them the data. How do I get this data? Show them the reports. Explain to them the start to finish. Understand what goes into it. Understand the, the small print on the contracts. Understand everything. And once I show them, they trust me because they know that I'm there every step of the way. I walk them through the process and I'm there to fight very hard for them, whether they're selling a home or buying a home. I'm here to make sure that deal is completed. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you in the show. Absolutely. Thank Excellent. you very much. I truly appreciate you guys. Hi, and that's it for another show. Thanks very much for your company. Thanks to all of our guests and especially to Amy Engelman and the team from Vipo. Next time when we come back with the business show, Amy and I will be catching up with John Knight from Business Depot. We dig deep with John to find out what he's learned over the years as he works with some of the best operators in Australia. I'll be back next time with John Knight and Amy Engelman I'm Kevin Turner from Christchurch in New Zealand. Look forward to seeing you next time.